How do corporations create value? In essence, they raise money at one rate and they turn around and invest that money at a higher rate. It's that difference between the two interest rates that is so important. The total value created is equal to the amount of capital they employ times the difference between those two interest rates. The toughest part in figuring out the cost of their capital is the cost of equity. And a lot of people are using beta to compute the cost of equity. You can go out and get the beta for a company off of Yahoo Finance or Google Finance. And you know what? The value you get from that free financial information is worth every penny you pay. Let's talk about a sophisticated approach consistent with financial theory to calculate the beta and get you the best cost of capital that you can possibly estimate. How are practicing equity analysts coming up with the cost of equity? In the largest survey done of practicing equity analysts, it revealed that a lot of them are using some very basic techniques to actually calcul calculate the cost of equity. 43% um, answered they're taking the bond yield and adding on a risk premium to that. It's really a pretty archaic way of getting that cost of equity. Another 48% said that they're doing a judgmentally determined uh, hurdle rate for the cost of equity. In other words, it's a pretty vague answer associated with that. Academics have come up with a number of sophisticated approaches, like APT, but only 5% of practicing equity analysts indicate that they're using that. Only 4% are indicating they're using the Fama and French method. However, 68% of them are using the capital assets pricing model, which is called CAPM. And of those that use CAPM, 78, they, they indicate that they're using it in 78% of the cases. To use CAPM, you've got to come up with a measure of risk because CAPM is saying that the expected return is a linear function of the risk. This measure of risk is called beta. So let's dive into how to actually get a great beta estimate. How can you use Capital IQ to generate a sophisticated estimate of beta, which is a risk measure for a stock? Let's start off with Excel. I recommend downloading the S&P Capital IQ plugin. So I'm going to click on this, which is up here on the ribbon for Excel. And under templates, you'll be able to find that there is a beta calculation and it's found under the valuation tab and templates. I'm gonna click on this historical beta calculation template and it's gonna download it. You can see that it takes a minute because it's actually going out to the S&P Capital IQ server and downloading data. This is the beta calculation sheet. And let me show you um, the main output associated with this. What this is doing is it's calculating a beta for a particular company. And the company that it starts off with is actually S&P Global with the ticker symbol of SPGI. You can see that it calculates a beta of about 1.15 for this company, but it goes further and calculates an adjusted beta as well, which is actually significantly different. It's actually 0.94 on an adjusted basis. So, what if you wanted to change this? Um, I think that actually what, what we should do first is just talk about where all this information is coming from and the inputs associated with it. So first, you've got an index that's comparing it to. Um, when you're calculating a beta, you're comparing the returns on a particular asset to the returns on the overall market. And in this case, our proxy that is used to represent the market is the Standard & Poor's 500 index. Of course, this is not the entire market. There are more than 500 stocks out there, but this is a very commonly known index that uh, does a good job of representing the market. It's a valuated index. There are others out here, right? So you can actually just scroll in here and get something more appropriate if you choose. Um, you can choose a different frequency. The uh, standard approach for calculating beta is to use 60 months of data. And you can see that's actually what this is doing. It's going from 2013 to 2018 in this case. So it's basically getting five years of data and it's getting 60 months over that time period. This first tickle, ticker symbol is a very important input. What you wanna do is put in the ticker symbol of the company that you're analyzing. In this case, it's got S&P Global. And what it does is it finds peer companies, companies in the same peer set. Um, 
what you can see when you actually dive into that formula associated with this, and I'm going to highlight the formula up here, is it's actually getting the quick comp set, quick comparable set, and it's going out to capital IQ and finding companies that are very comparable. For the first couple of these, these actually are really close competitors. It's got Moody's Corporation, FactSet. I mean, these are providers of financial inf information. Um, down here, it's got some other ones like uh, the Korea Ratings Company. It's obviously on um, the Korean Stock Exchange. I wouldn't pick this one for a comparable. It's got a couple of exchanges in here as well, like ICE, um, the CBOE as well. I don't think those are as comparable. You can take some of these out if you need to. How is it calculating this, um, this particular adjusted beta? Well, it's taking this list of comparable companies and it's downloading data over in this data sheet. You can see that it's got historical returns, prices and returns for S&P Global, which is the company we're valuing. And it's also downloading the information from Capital IQ for its peers. This one is Moody's, this one is Facts at Research, you can see here. And it's using that to come up with the variance of the sample. Um, and it's basically computing the adjusted beta using that. It's got a definition here. This approach is using what's called the Vasicek method. And here S&P is actually comparing it to that Bloomberg beta adjustment method. And I agree with Capital IQ that this is really a superior method associated with this. If you look at doing it in Bloomberg, it is a very simplistic adjustment that they have. And basically they come up with an adjusted beta by taking one third times the market beta. Remember the market beta is just one and they are uh, multiplying the raw beta by two thirds. Remember that you get this raw beta by just doing a simple linear regression. You're regressing the returns on the stock against the returns on the market. In this case, it's a particular index. And of course, you've got some choices to the time period. You're always left with this question of, does the riskiness of the company remain constant over a five-year period over that 60 months? I think increasingly our answer is that it's probably not stable over that time period. Companies in today's uh, disruptive economy, they change quite quickly. They acquire new companies. They shed business lines. They get out of industries. I don't think these betas are very stable. Where this particular adjusted beta excels is that it is different from the Bloomberg beta in two ways. First of all, what it's doing is it's identifying stocks in the same industry. And it's using um, that and it's basically it's got a second difference in the sense that it's weighting the uh, various betas in a different way. It's weighting it based on the variance that it calculates from that industry sample as well as the variance it's getting from that individual security. So you can see down here in this formula that it's got this adjusted beta right here and these V's are basically the variance calculations. The second difference is in the way it is using the weightings associated with this. The weightings are another difference and the way it's doing these weightings is it's taking the variance of both that individual security as well as the variance of the industry sample. And you can see it's got a weighting here. Unlike the Bloomberg method, it's not multiplying times the beta of the market. Instead, this BM is actually the uh, average beta of the industry sample. So it's weighting against that. Companies should be of a similar riskiness to the companies in their industry. Certainly of a more similar riskiness than just the market as a whole. So I think this is a really great adjustment that they're doing here. Um, again, they're using actual peer companies. They're doing a different weighting scheme in this Vasicek adjusted beta. Um, they're not using just the market beta of one. They're using that average beta of the industry sample. There's a lot of differences associated with this. Let me go back to this and show you how this would change. I mean, what if we decide to do uh, Duncan Brands? The symbol is DNKN. So I'm going to type that in. You can see what it does is it goes out and identifies the peer companies of Duncan. And the levered beta for Duncan is 0.31, but the adjusted beta is actually higher. 
why are we doing an adjustment? I want to make sure everyone understands the big picture. The reason why we're doing an adjustment for these betas is because we're trying to adjust it in a way that's going to be more accurate, that it's going to give us a better cost of equity estimate. And we assume that these betas tend to mean revert somewhat. They tend to uh, go towards either the uh, overall beta of the market over time or they go to the overall industry beta over time. That is their tendency. So if they are doing some type of reversion, why not incorporate that into our analysis and get a better estimate of the cost of equity? Are these peers for Duncan actually accurate? I mean, I have to say that I think this is really interesting. Uh, a lot of these, in my opinion, just aren't serving the same types of things. I mean, they are restaurants, but uh, they're not, they don't have that focus on coffee like Duncan Brands does. So, um, you know, feel free to alter this set of peers here as, as you need in order to come up with a new adjusted beta. But again, if I was trying to estimate the cost of equity for Duncan, I would either use that raw beta or preferably I would use that adjusted beta, which in this case is 0 0.41.